Good morning, Aldersgate. To those who are here in person, and to those who are watching us online, we welcome you this morning to All Saints Sunday. I would also, at this time, like to welcome our guest musicians, Martina Bleeke, Rachel Grip, Alona Orban, and Amy Peters. Would you please stand for the call to worship? And you will also be remaining standing for our hymn, which there will not be the words on the screen today, so you'll be wanting to follow along in the hymnal number 711, verses 1, 2, 4, and 6, and also keep standing for our gospel reading. Our call to worship, God, we remember those saints who have gone before us. We will lament their passing. And honor their legacy. We give thanks for all we have learned from them. Those who followed the way of Christ faithfully. We follow their example. Those who made mistakes along the way. We learn from their experience. Those who made progress for peace. Those who lived simply and quietly. We are enlightened by them. Those who gain honor and distinction without pride. We are humbled by them. Those who were martyred for their faith. We commend them to your care. They have finished their work on earth. And it lives on. Reverberating into our lives now. As the work of Christ lives on. May the peace of Christ continue to inspire us to good works, humility, simplicity, and peacemaking. As those foremothers and forefathers were inspired by him to live in grace and love. Amen. Again, our opening hymn. reading this morning is from Luke chapter 16 verses 1 to 13 it's the parable of the shrewd, shrewd manager then Jesus said to the disciples there was a rich man who had a manager 
and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have, de I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This then is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated for naming the honored dead. This morning is All Saints Sunday, and it is the day in which we lift up and name those who have passed in the last year. Um, there will be a couple of names that um, I received this morning that will also be included, but you have the printed list that I'll be reading from in your bulletins this morning. Uh, noted next to the names of those who were members or, or active constituents in our church family, uh, you'll see that asterisk listing them. After we have read and lit the candles for those that we will be naming um, during the special music that will follow, um, that will be an opportunity for those of you who would like to come up. We've got a station on either side with additional candles. Uh, if you have loved ones and family members who are departed that you would like to honor this morning, um, during that special music, you'll be invited and welcome to come forward and light one of those candles, if you wish. We remember Melvin L. Aldridge. Forrest Malcolm Arnold. Paula K. Barnhart. Janet K. Berkey Brown. Charles Bricker. J. F. Brower. Janet K. Brown. Kelly L. Burns. Kenneth M. Cisna. Tom Cormany. Margaret Cundy. Mark A. Dath. Mm -hmm. 
Robert Bob Dick. Virginia E. Gilb. Dan Goose. Walter G. Hackett the third. Todd E. Haynes. Anthony F. Hoffman. Marjorie J. Herbst. Jacqueline Isaacs. Jack V. Gerard. Wayne W. Johnson. Dennis J. Malott. Ann Michael. Maggie Montreal. Keith A. Peters. Alexis Aaron Rucker. Mary Lou Shep. Catherine K. D. Shirts. Betty Thompson. <coughs> Carol J. Walker. Elaine Walsh. Christine Worley. Jerry West. Famous Williams. Robert L. Rablowski, Sr. Christopher LaRoque Malice. Sally Todd. Elva Bixler. All Saints Day is that day in which we honor and remember those who have departed and gone on to glory for the impact, for the role, the place that they held in our lives, we give thanks to God. We celebrate all that they have meant to us. And so as an act of remembrance, we light these candles as the names have been read. And as the choir offers this special music, Precious in His Sight, we invite those of you who would like to come forward and light a candle on behalf of one or more individuals that have passed that were a part of your life as well.
the prayers you have made. I'll be your guide. I'll be your friend. Turn to me when troubles have no end. I know how to bring my children through the wilderness and how to dress the I can turn darkness to light. Fear not, fear not, you are precious in my sight. Members of the choir want to take a moment to come down and light candles as well. I don't see any uh, young people here, but wanted to, I was planning on talking about this, and, and I still would like to. So um, when we think about all of these names that have been read and lifted up and all of those individuals that you have come forward to acknowledge and remember, I'm sure there's some heaviness, some grief that still lingers over having said goodbye to someone that meant so much. But it's also a joyous occasion. When you look at the light of all of these candles that have touched so many lives and continue to remain with us, the fact that we're still remembering, the fact that the love is still strong, all testify to the importance that those individuals held in our lives. There's a, a 
theologian and, and author by the name of Marva Dawn, and um, I can't remember even the book that it was in, but the, the line in this book of hers that really stuck out to me was that we can see so much further when we stand upon the shoulders of giants. Now, she was talking about those theological forebears, those people that have come and articulated understandings about our faith so that when we stand upon their shoulders, we can get a better glimpse and a better understanding. But had the children been here this morning, I would have asked them, how many have ever been lifted up and placed on their father's or mother's shoulders to get a better glimpse at a parade, at the zoo, at somewhere where there's a crowd pressing in, they get lifted up and placed upon the shoulders of someone that cares for them and loves them so that they can have a better perspective. Well, in many ways, all of these saints that we name this morning have done that for us. Some maybe literally, but others figuratively. That we are who we are because they were a part of our lives. We are who we are because they loved us, they taught us, they cared for us, they nurtured us. So I invite you to bow with me this morning as we give thanks to the saints in our lives. Most gracious God, you have knit together this whole human family that we're all a part of. And yet there are some connections that have meant all the more to us in our lives. And some of those connections are people who are no longer with us. And yet we still feel and remember that connection that we had. We thank you, God, for blessing us with the saints that have gone before, those people that we loved and called mother and father and sister and brother and child and friend and spouse and companion. To all of these, we thank you for having blessed us. And we pray, God, that in our own ways, you would strengthen us to be those living saints who continue to be that force of good and love and positivity in the lives of those that we're connected with. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Feels like we've had a full service already. <laughs> But I get to talk a little bit about our stewardship series this week. And we get this wonderful passage from Luke 16 about the dishonest manager. I've had a couple people say, well, good luck with that one. It's a challenging passage, to say the least. It's one in which a lot of people read it and walk away scratching their heads saying, what? is Jesus talking about? Make for yourselves friends by dishonest wealth? This manager, or the, the rich man, commends the manager for being shrewd even though he was inept and dishonest in his practices? And Jesus comes along and hands us this parable and says, here you go, do you get it? And we're all shaking our heads saying No. I will say there is one positive so far that I have found in this. You may remember the, the story of the uh, Good Samaritan. And someone says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes about and tells this story of the, the Good Samaritan, of the two individuals who were pious religious folk that came by and kept on going. And then the Samaritan, who would have been the least likely, actually stops and offers kindness and compassion. And Jesus gets done. And the, the person that posed the question to him, Jesus says, so... Who showed mercy? Well, and the man said, well, you're the one that helped him. And Jesus said, yes, go and do likewise. Well, thank God Jesus didn't say go and do likewise with this story of this dishonest manager because we'd be in a world of trouble. Now, there's all kinds of commentaries and all kinds of things that people have to say about this passage because it is a difficult passage. Jesus teaches parable in parables that we might find and understand the, the moral, the lesson of the story. 
It's a made-up story, so this is not a real rich man and not a real manager who does this. But Jesus tells this story for us to learn something. And we want to know what it is. Well, part of what I see a lot of the commentators doing when they look at this passage is we try and find a way to make sense of this passage so that it doesn't make us have to think something different. It doesn't leave us scratching our heads in wonder and confusion. And they want to try and come up with some feasible, possible explanation for why Jesus would tell this story. Well, to be frank, I'm not the scholar that they are, but all of those kind of leave me wanting. I can see where they're trying to get to the point of, well, maybe this manager that did all of this negotiating behind the scenes of wiping away some of the debt, well, maybe that was his commission that he was giving up to get in the good graces of these people. Some would say that maybe this rich man actually wasn't the most honest in his business practices. And according to Jewish law, charging usury or high interest rates was prohibited. Well, maybe this rich man had been doing that and doesn't call the manager to task on it because, well, he's just kind of covering up some of his master's mistakes. There are all sorts of explanations and plausible scenarios that get offered up, but at the end of the day, we're still trying to sort out what would Jesus have each of us to learn from this. My take on this passage, and the reason we're looking at it this morning, as we're engaging in this, this stewardship series, we're looking at Wesley's principles of earn, save, and give. Now, Wesley actually used this text as his basis for this sermon as well. And early in the sermon, Wesley writes about this passage. He says, Our Lord imparted a suburb segment of Christian wisdom to all of his followers. Wesley and others did point out that in this passage, it says that Jesus began to teach the disciples. Jesus wasn't teaching this to the Pharisees who were known to be lovers of money. Jesus was speaking to his followers. This was an insider talk to those who were closest to him saying, all right, here's what you need to understand. And he tells them this parable. Now, Wesley says it pertains to the proper use of money. He says the people of the world customarily speak a great deal about the money, but those whom God has chosen out of the world do not adequately consider its use. Even in Wesley's day, 300 years ago, people were a little uncomfortable in religious circles talking about money. In fact, there was this idea that, well, money was a bad thing. But as Wesley points out, and I think as Jesus would say as well, money in and of itself is not a bad thing. Now, money can be used for bad purposes, but money can also be used for good purposes. Money can be used to fund wars and buy illicit materials. But money is also necessary to put a roof over the heads of your family and to put food on the table. The money in and of itself is not the problem. It's our attitude toward the money. And it's how we use that money. And the problem that many people run into is that, as, as Wesley points out, people of the world customarily speak a great deal about money. But as people of faith, we feel that God has called us back out of the world or to be different or set apart from the world. And so surely then we have to act and talk differently with regard to money than the people of the world. Well, Wesley's interpretation of what Jesus is saying, and, and I think maybe one that helps me to best understand this, is that when it comes to being wise, shrewd, practical with money, there are some lessons of the world that maybe aren't bad ones for us to incorporate into our use and relationship with money. That this manager, for whatever incompetence he had in squandering the rich man's wealth, who then is called to account for that and says, oh my word, I'm in trouble. I'm not young enough or strong enough to go dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. I need to figure out how to make sure that things go well for me. 
So he tries to get himself in the good graces of some of the people in debt to his master. Doesn't necessarily mean it was right or wrong, but he was commended for it by the rich man. For looking at all of the things that were before him, all of the the materials and resources that he had at hand, and thinking about what can I do to try and secure a little bit of security going forward. And so he's not commended for being incompetent. He's not commended for being dishonest. He's commended for being shrewd, for being decisive and taking a firm step when it was necessary. Wesley sees this as part of his, his admonition that we should earn all we can. But he sets up some parameters and guidelines for what he means by that. I've got far too much Wesley to quote, and I've got too many notes to keep track of this morning. So for Wesley, he begins by saying that, particularly that money, though, in and of itself, is not the issue. That money is not a bad thing. In fact, Wesley goes so far as to say money can be used wrongly, but what cannot be used, misused. He said, however, money can also be used properly, and money is equally suited to the best as well as the worst of all of us. Money is of indescribable benefit to all civilized nations in all the common affairs of life. It is, most, it is the most condensed means for tra- transacting all kinds of business and of doing all kinds of good, especially if we use it according to Christian wisdom. He said, in our present state, through, um, through money, it is an excellent gift from God. For many people that looked upon money as this evil that, well, you know, we we need to keep ourselves distant from that. And even in some Christian traditions, particularly in some of the monastic communities, people took vows of poverty because they saw money as something that pulled them down. And so they intentionally separated themselves from it and lived under those vows of poverty. For Wesley's audience, many of his audience were the lower class the working people, the people that struggled to make ends meet. Their view of money was they didn't have enough and the rich people that did weren't that kind or generous with it. And so even their perception of money was probably a little skewed. But Wesley says, no, money is an excellent gift from God. Now for those people, particularly the large bulk of his audience hearing that, that probably made them perk up and say, wait, what? Money's a gift from God? Because Wesley goes on and says, In the hands of God's children, money is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and clothing for the naked. For the pilgrim and stranger, money provides a place to lie down for rest, and by the right use of money, we can provide for others. Money can serve as a husband for the widow and a father to the orphans. It can supply protection for the oppressed, a means of health for the sick, and comfort for those in pain. Money can become as eyes to the blind and feet to the lame, and indeed, money can lift up others from the gates of death. Wesley saw that money in and of itself was a gift from God when rightly used, which then led him to that point of, so we should earn all we can. Now, again, I I mentioned that he he had some qualifications or, or caveats to that as far as what he means by that. Because he says, gain all you can without paying more than it is worth. And he goes and lists several instances where the price that we pay to earn all we can may be too high. He says, gain all you can, but not at the expense of your health. That working seven days a week for long, unending hours just to get a little bit more and a little bit more, well... I suspect some of us have maybe experienced burnout at at one time or another in life, that where the hours just take a toll on us and, and our physical health deteriorates because of it. What's worse, sometimes relationships deteriorate and become damaged because of those long hours. And admittedly, some people don't have a lot of choice over those hours, but sometimes we do. And the choice to go and put in a few more hours to gain a little bit more instead of being where we should be with family and people that are important to us takes a toll that is far more 
than we should be willing to pay. He goes on to say that gain all you can, but not at the expense of your soul. That, that there may be things that are legal, enterprises, that may not be healthy for our soul. In the book by James Harnish about the, the, this material, he talks about having a young man that came to him in the last church that he served. And this young man was, was working for a cable company and installing cable and internet connections in a hotel that was being built. And he found out that one of the things that this, host, that this hotel would be providing as a part of their, their cable and internet service in the rooms was pornography. And this was a young man that at one point in his life had dealt with an addiction to pornography. And he went to Reverend Harnish and said, I, I don't think I can in good conscience keep this job. And they had a conversation about it. And this young man ended up going and resigning from this job without necessarily knowing what his next job would be, but trusting that God would provide for him something that would provide for he and his family without putting a toll upon his conscience. And finally, Wesley says that to gain all we can, we should do so not at the expense of others or at the expense of neighbors. Indeed, Jesus called us to not only love God, but to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so engaging in business practice that capitalize on and, and take advantage of others would be an indication that maybe that's not a good way to go about gaining all we can. And that's where the temptation and the struggle lies. That sometimes for some people that idea of gain all we can me, is driven by greed. It's not that they're being industrious and they're not living up to God's full potential of who they were created to be but it's just simply about acquiring more and more and more. We don't have to look very far in the news to, to hear about people that engage in business in such a way. And it's been a few years ago, but Bernie Madoff with that huge pyramid scam that he ran and people lost millions of dollars and their entire life savings or their entire retirement was gone because of someone else's greed. So don't gain all you can at the expense of others. Wesley goes on and talks about that even within that, there are just people who are unscrupulous, that they're not good at their job, or they cut corners and they, they shave edges just to, to save and make a little bit more, and at the end of the day, that's where other people end up paying the price. But he says that we should gain all we can. And he continues that, that within that, he says we should observe these cautions and restrictions. He said it is the solemn duty of all who engage in worldly business to notice the first and principal rule of Christian wisdom with respect to money. Gain all you can. He says this is, this is what we're commended to do. In fact, if you look at Scripture, there is indeed numbers of instances where we're encouraged to be fruitful, and multiply. And in the creation story in Genesis, God says, tend the land, bring forth crops, and, and do those things that ultimately would lead to people providing for themselves and supporting themselves. But Wesley says, gain all you can by honest industry. Work hard. Excel at what you do. And in fact, Wesley goes on in the sermon to talk a little bit about the fact that, that we should even strive to be a little bit better at what we do each day. How can we improve and be better at whatever trade we apply ourselves to? Because, and, and I think this is the crux that, that should be a part of this statement when Wesley makes it, he says, gain all you can by honest industry and exercise all possible diligence in your calling. Exercise all possible diligence in your calling. Wesley doesn't just see this as a job that you go out and you clock in and you clock out and you grumble and complain like everybody else because you had to go to work. Wesley says, apply yourself to your calling. 
A God-given calling. And we often talk about calling being those people that end up in in professional or full-time ministry. But Luther talked about the priesthood of all believers. That every person, lay or clergy, has been called. A few years ago, I was serving a church in Rensselaer, and we were talking about this idea of calling being something beyond just a ministry. And I I happened to ask the the Sunday school class that I was leading at the time of, of adults, I said, do any of you in the occupation that you are engaged in right now feel that you were called by God to do what you're doing? Well, this woman in the class immediately her hand shot up, and she said, I do. She said, from the time I was a little girl, I knew that God wanted me to be a school teacher, and that's what I've done for the last probably 30 or 40 years at that point in her life. And she said, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. She felt that God had called her to that work of doing what she was doing. What would be different in your life right now if you considered the things that you're doing something that God has called you to? And I know some of you are probably at a point in life where you're looking at me saying, well, I'm retired. But what if you look at your retirement as a calling from God as well? A calling to do something different than what you had done. A calling to be available in ways that maybe you weren't available before. A calling to be able to invest yourself in things that you'd always wanted to but never had the time for. And while many of you may be thinking, well, yeah, I'm not necessarily going to work and collecting a paycheck anymore. These principles that Wesley is talking about of earning all you can imply that that shrewdness, that diligence of that dishonest manager who really thought things through might be something that you need to apply to managing your pension or considering how your investments that are your source of income are being handled? Do you have someone of wise counsel that helps you with that? Are you mindful about where those things are invested? Are they socially responsible? Do you feel comfortable with where it's invested? Those are decisions for you to think about and reflect upon, but but Wesley's point is when it comes to earning all we can, we need to be involved. We need to be intentional. We need to think it through. And in fact, Wesley's last point in the first section of this sermon, when he talks about earning all we can, he concludes the last section by saying, in gaining all you can, use common sense. Use common sense about the things that you're doing, about the ways that you're going about earning. Use common sense to make sure that what you're doing will provide for your needs, but also in a way that honors God. One of the reasons that so many people get squeamish about talking about money in church, and this was pointed out to me by another author by the name of Lovett Weems. He said, too often in church, we talk about people's personal finances apart from their discipleship. But the truth of it is, how we handle our financial affairs individually and privately is a part of our discipleship. It's a reflection of the relationship and the role that Jesus Christ plays in our lives. And so while we handle those personal finances should be an extension of the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. And when we as a church talk about our finances together, It's easy sometimes to get caught up in the fact of, well, we've got a boiler that needs replaced, we've got a roof that's leaking, we've got utility bills that need paid, and we could go on and on about maintenance and other issues like that. I've never been in a church meeting where some of those conversations come up and someone gets excited and said, ooh, ooh, can I pay for that? That doesn't inspire or motivate people. And that's where Dr. Weems says that the problem in churches is that we often forget to talk about the church's finances in terms of our mission, of what it is that God has called us to be and to do for the sake of the world. And so that's where we need to be mindful of the fact that God has called us and placed us here to be the body of Christ in this corner, in this neighborhood, in this part of Fort Wayne, Indiana. That God has equipped us with people with talents to be able to offer wonderful music in leading our worship, 
to provide us with the space to offer an academy that allows families with young people that are working to be able to send them to somewhere where they're safe and they can learn and grow and become the young people that they need to be to be ready to go to school. That because we are here, we have opportunities for people to learn and to grow in their faith. And we're able to open up our facilities to groups like AA that are making a difference in the lives of people who need to find that support in recovering from an addiction. Friends, those are the things that are our mission, and we happen to have a building that helps to make that thing that we do possible. And yes, maintaining this building does come at a price of keeping the lights on, of keeping things in good repair. But we pay for those things out of our church budget and from the contributions that you give so that we can fulfill that mission that God has called us to. That mission is possible because each of you have earned all you can and because the leadership of our church is doing what they can for our church to earn what we can and make that possible. So what do we make of this manager? Like I said, Jesus didn't say go and do likewise, so we won't. But at the end of the day, it comes down to how wise how prudent, how practical and shrewd we are in the myriad of little decisions that we'll make each day. The late theologian and and pastor Fred Craddock about this passage said that the realism of these sayings that we find in Luke 16 is that life consists of a series of seemingly small opportunities. Craddock says most of us will not this week christen a ship, write a book, end a war, appoint a cabinet, dine with the queen, convert a nation, or be burned at the stake. He says more likely the week will present no more than a chance to give a cup of water, write a note, visit a nursing home, Vote for a county commissioner, teach a Sunday school class, share a meal, tell a child a story, go to choir practice, and feed the neighbor's cat. Because after all, it was Jesus who said, whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. So friends, if there's something that we need to take away from this manager, we need to continue learning and practicing and growing in what it means to be faithful in little things. Because when we're faithful in those little things, well, when the big things come along, we'll be faithful in them as well. Amen. This morning, as we uh, reflect upon the gratitude and the gift that the excellent gift that money is in our lives. Uh, We're mindful of the ways that we express that gratitude, and one of them is through the offering and the gifts that we give. Uh, The giving boxes are by the doors, and we are grateful for all of the support that you've given to Aldersgate, and I invite you to reflect upon uh, the offertory that Phyllis will be sharing with us now.
as we go to our time of prayers this morning, um, would uh, bring your attention to the floral arrangements that are up here this morning. The flowers were given by Mary Lou Rigdon in uh, memory of her son, Christopher uh, LaRoque Malice, that we lifted up during the, the naming of, of those who had passed. Um, also, I would uh, include on our prayer list this morning um, Chuck McNeely. Um, some of you may have gotten to have, have had an opportunity to meet Chuck and Jean. They, they usually sit kind of over in this middle section right here. They're fairly new to Aldersgate, but during the pandemic, I know it's not been as easy to meet new faces. Um, Chuck and Jean were friends of mine. They were actually parishioners of mine when I'd served in Marion, and they, they moved up here about two years ago. And so they've been, they've been coming here. Um, Chuck had a, a surgery this week just a few days ago for some blood clots in his legs, and so he's at Lutheran and um, I believe should be coming home either today or tomorrow, but uh, do continue to pray for Chuck's healing. Prayers from our section over here to my right. Moving into the, the next section. Any prayers from over here? I'd like to ask for prayers for the family of Charles Bricker, who passed away this past week. Um, he uh, uh, hadn't been coming to Aldersgate very long before the pandemic, and so I hadn't seen him very much recently, but he was a very friendly and kind man, and uh, I'll miss him. Uh, the next section. And over to my left. Carl and I just want to thank Allersgate for all the calls and all the cards and everything that we have gotten from you. It's been a wonderful relationship with you. Thank you again and again for the loss of our, for helping with the loss of our son. Thank you. And we uh, musicians want to lift up Mor Morgan Spavik, who was to play the viola this morning, but I got a, a text from her last evening that she has uh, COVID. And so please keep uh, Morgan in your prayers. Well, if you would, let us bow and pray together. Most gracious God, we give you thanks on this day. We give you thanks for this great cloud of witnesses who surround us, who encourage us, and have demonstrated to us what it means to live a life of faith. We give you thanks for those who have gone before and have continued to be with us. And we give you thanks for the hope that they had because of your son, Jesus. We give you thanks, Lord, for the support that this community provides to one another as grace is shared in times of challenge. We are grateful for our church family that can be there to let us know that we're not alone and that we are cared for and loved. We pray for Morgan and Chuck and all others who are recovering from illness or injury or surgeries. We know, Lord, there are many that have been named in our hearts but not lifted up. And to each, we pray that you would attend to their needs. We pray for the family of Charles Bricker, that your peace and your presence would be with them as they prepare to pay their respects and have his memorial service tomorrow. 
And we ask your blessings upon our church as we continue to be looking to you for guidance and wisdom in all the ways that we serve as the body of Christ to this world around us. We pray all of these things, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. As we turn to our sacrament of Holy Communion, we're reminded that this table that we're gathered around is those who are present and in this place, that it is connected to those who are joining us online and worshiping from at home, and that it is even at this table that spans time and space that this cloud of witnesses is represented by these candles and we're reminded that they gather with us as well. So with Christ as our host, we come to receive, to love him, and to be embraced in his love. So I invite you to join with me. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When our Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and your Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you do it, do so in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to the disciples and said, Take and drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make this be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And so it is with the confidence of God's children that we are bold to pray that prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in Christ's blood. The body of Christ, 
is broken for you. And the blood of Christ is shed for you. Mighty God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have offered yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give of ourselves for others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a couple of items to lift up for you this morning in our announcements. Um, information in there about... Uh, Equal exchange and some of the things that are available back there in the marketplace. Also, a reminder that um, the 14th is when those shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child need to be in. Uh, Kringle orders are taking place back there in the marketplace, also. And a reminder that um, George's uh, class, Words for Daily Living, will resume this morning in the lounge and also Wednesdays at 6 o'clock here at the church. And finally, today um, is our annual charge conference. We'll be participating in the charge conference through Zoom. I've received the link for that through, uh, from the district secretary. Um, if you are interested in participating, you are more than welcome to. You'll just need to send me an email, and I will send that to you. Um, our operations team, as well as members of the church council, are eligible voting members for our charge conference. And so uh, if you need that link, um, please let me know, and I will make sure you have it before this evening. It's, the, the Zoom is scheduled to start at 7 o'clock this evening, so um, once you have that link, you can participate from the comfort of your own home. Our closing hymn this morning is For the Bread Which You Have Broken. It's on uh, page 614 in the hymnal. I invite you now to stand as we uh, conclude our worship this day. Our gospel reading this morning concluded with Jesus saying, no one can serve two masters. You'll either hate one and love the other or love one and despise the other. And then he said, no one can serve God and wealth. Friends, our call as disciples of Jesus is to keep God first and foremost in our lives. That God would be the greatest and truest and first love of our lives in all things. And in doing so, we earn all we can and use those gifts that God provides, that excellent gift of money, to support ourselves and our families and to participate in God's work in this world. And that is possible when God comes first. So go forth this day. Earn all you can and be blessed because God is first in your life. Amen.